So we have these weird dynamics with economics. We've also discussed zoning in the, con in the, in the context of aesthetics. Right? What do I mean by aesthetics? Things that don't look pretty can be, can be banned. So at various junctures, we did the UFO house case, we did others, cities have been able to actually tell people, no, you can't build that because we don't like how it looks. You need to fit with our standard of beauty, or whatever that is, in order to actually construct something. So again, you know, the pluses and minuses of this one. On the plus side, you can make things look pretty. You make things look consistent. You don't have an impact on property values. On the downside, there's a very serious intrusion on the ability of people to build what they want, where they want, in the manner they want. And this is not a trivial cost, although by and large in virtually every single city of any size, the individual has more or less been cast aside. And the welfare, the general welfare, is determined by the people in the neighborhood already who want to keep things looking the same and keep property prices up. Okay? So zoning very clearly illustrates this issue of general welfare. Right? Whose welfare are we talking about? Are we talking about the welfare of the people already there or everyone? And there's no good way of really defining which one it is. Whenever you make any land use decision, someone's going to get hurt and someone's going to be better off. The question we focus on today is who should be making that decision? The government, in terms of zoning boards, or the free market? And I'll refine that in a moment. Who will better take care of defining and protecting the general welfare? Zoning boards or individuals? And before you reflexively answer, of course the government will take care of private individuals, I would ask you to consider the case we've cited so far. Mount Laurel, UFO House, the one from Issaquah, right? In all these cases, the government was not serving at the general welfare. They were serving at the welfare of a very specific group. Those who've had the most influence on the zoning board. The architects, the cronies, their friends. So before you reflexively say, of course the answer is the government. Think about that. But before you reflexively say, of course the free market is the best way of defining this, I'd ask you to take a step back and consider what happens when there isn't enough money to build low-income housing. When the, when the decisions the city makes about uh, <laughs> spacing stuff out makes it impossible to have public transportation. What are people who can't afford cars? How are they supposed to get around? So there's pluses and minuses to both sides. My goal for today is for you to see those pluses and minuses. You can decide for yourself whatever decision you come up with. I really, I really don't care. But I want you to not reflect we think, oh, one's good and one's bad. And Houston is an interesting city because it doesn't have formal zoning codes, but it's worked around it to create these informal apparatuses, which accomplish many of the goals of zoning without some of the downsides. And I'll conclude by feeding this into some of the broader trends of cost of living which is very closely associated with housing prices. Okay? So first, before we get started, uh, where did I finish last time? Is it right there? Okay, thank you. Um, so before we get started, let's try to walk through, right? What are some of the ways... Actually, I'll, I'll get a little history first. Sorry, i have got about two minutes. So how is it, historically, that the city of Houston does not have a zoning code, right? How is this even possible? Well, if you, if you read some of the articles, they're, they're somewhat critical of the founders of Houston, but I'll, I'll, I'll leave that criticism aside. That's not my goal. Um, 
The reason why is very simple. Someone at some point made the decision to put in our city charter that any zoning code must be passed by popular referendum. The people have to vote for it. In other words, the legislature, the city council, cannot on its own accord institute a zoning code. That the people, by referendum, and I'm sure many of you voted yesterday for these referendums, the people of Houston have to vote for it. That's not an accident. Putting something on the ballot means the actual people who benefit or harm from it will vote for it. And there have been three attempts, I think the most recent one was in the early 90s, there have been three attempts at putting zoning on the Houston ballot. All three have failed. Why do you think they failed? All right, Judy, you're up now. Why do you think efforts to add zoning to our city code have failed? What, what, do, you, what do you think might be behind that decision of the voters? Uh, as, as what? An You're, yeah, you're right. It's just, it's, yeah. Why do you think that is? Good. So this is an advertisement put out by the Houston Publishing, so Houston Planning Association from 1962. Uh, it's hard to read, it says Houston unzoned, the finest and fastest growing city in America. This was you know, 55 years ago. Um, and, and this commercial I think explains it well. Zoning means one man rule. Uh, and you see this little guy saying, I just want to have a room at my house. And the zoning inspector, this gladiator, has him by the hair. And then the judge, jury, and prosecutor with his zoning ordinance says, $200 a day fine. I'm the boss. Don't forget it. So, I mean, this is a very, as Zoe, Zoe used the word intrusion, right? This is a very uh, 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 you know, imposing advertisement that if you allow zoning to come on, you'll have this basically this board of tyrants who make a decision and allow this to happen. Okay? But what's interesting about this is that you would think that the people who will be most opposed to this type of intrusion are those who have money, those who want to develop, those who want to build industry, <coughs> right? But what's interesting is many of the poorest groups in Houston oppose zoning. In the last referendum, African Americans and Hispanics voted against the zoning referendum in large numbers, right? Danielle, do you want to take a stab and guess why some of the poorer groups in Houston would oppose zoning? What do you think? Well, maybe they hear something like what happened in like Texas that they, you know, there would be no low-income housing or middle-income housing for them. Exactly. So think about this, right? How the heck was Mount Laurel able to do what they were able to do? By saying, okay, we're going to zone the entire city as one-family homes, and we're not going to leave any free area to build something else. So even if there were developers wanting to build low-income housing, which in New Jersey there were people want to build that, they couldn't do it. <coughs> but also, I think you said something that was also correct, right? Zoning increases the cost of housing significantly. People who aren't necessarily going to low-income housing, maybe want middle-income housing, want cheaper housing stock. And I think they made the calculation correctly in my mind that these types of rules make everything more expensive. You know, a lot of big cities like New York or San Francisco want to say, how do we have more low-income housing? And their answer is usually, let's build more low-income housing. And the answer is never, let's make policies that would decrease the price of housing in the market. That, that seems to be a lesson which, which, which can't possibly correct, but I think Houston proves quite well. One of the ways to have housing is to make housing cheaper. And the way to make housing cheaper is not to have so many rules for building. But this bureaucracy, which is built into zoning, uh, inadvertently or deliberately raises housing <laughs> prices um, for everyone. 
Now, I, I should add, and this is still ongoing, I think the Houston uh, City Council has actually violated the city charter. Uh, Matt Festa, who teaches property also, has been all over this issue. Um, they've effectively instituted these various rules saying, oh, you can't have adult establishments here. Remember our zone de ratique, the, the burger flipping <laughs> joint, right? Uh, you can't have these adult establishments here. Uh, I don't think they can do this. I think they're acting legally, uh, but the, there's no legal challenge, so it's probably not going to go anywhere. Okay. So, officially, Houston has no zoning. It's been tried to be added, and it's failed several times. Right. But there are many ways in which the city has been able to indirectly add um, a zoning routines. All right, Joseph, walk, walk me through at least one of them. What's one of the ways that the city of Houston has been able to uh, uh, add somewhat like in, you know, indirect zoning laws? Uh, there's a bunch of like, smaller cities that are incorporated within the town, like Bel Air, Westview, Southside Place, and neighborhoods that Good. create their own Right. That then can pass their own Good. So I don't know if you know this, but for example, Bel Air, West University near Rice, those aren't the city of Houston. And you realize this very quickly when you see how, how nice the sidewalks are. Uh, I mean, somewhat facetious, but if you're ever driving down like Buffalo Speedway, you actually see the street signs change. They're not green anymore, they're blue. And you actually have a lot more sidewalks, places to walk around, larger grass spaces in front of the property. These are entirely different cities. And in fact, if I remember the history correctly, uh, Bel Air fought to basically exit from Houston because they wanted to have you know, these nicer lifestyles. Okay. So, okay. What's, what are some of the rules that Houston has imposed that aren't quite zoning, though? Tyler, what's one of them? Uh, I know there's certain regulations about like lot sizes outside the loop and Good. Certain, like the streets have to be certain ways. And okay, good. We'll do them all one at once. But there is no requirement in Houston law that you need to have only one family home. Remember that was the issue in, in Mount Laurel. They can only have one family homes. But instead, Houston has basically tried to achieve this by saying you need to have a minimum lot size. Okay. What do I mean by a minimum lot size? Houses have to be on a lot, uh, uh, this was until about 15 years ago, a 5,000 square feet minimum. 5,000 square foot minimum. Okay, That's the lot size. So this has a couple effects. It doesn't make much sense to build anything other than a one family home on such a large, a large lot size. right? If you build a two family home, you're going to need 10,000 square feet, right? So for each basically home, you need 5,000 square feet, and lots aren't that big. So what this law effectively does is it limits the number of houses that can be built in any given block. By saying you need at least a $5,000 lot size, you're limiting development. Okay? Is Perhaps, yeah. Yeah, I don't know which area you're talking about, but that, 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 that could be the case. Okay. So what's interesting then is big lot sizes has a couple other implications, right? If you need a large lot size, you can fit fewer houses in any given block, right? That's simple math. So that means things are more spaced apart. When things are more spaced apart, you have a much larger city. And this is what the articles refer to as sprawl, um, this word which you may have heard before, um, which, which seems almost defined to be in Houston, but I want to push back like whether it's necessarily bad. This is the idea where cities kind of spread out over large areas and aren't very densely filled. This is why you can have a tiny house on a huge lot. But also, one other aspect which I've learned very well since I moved to Houston is when things are spaced far apart, you don't walk as much. Everyone's nodding, yes. Yes, Houston is not very good for walking because you have to walk very far to go anywhere. It doesn't really make sense. When you have 
a lot of places where you can't walk, that promotes driving. So more people are likely to drive. When you have things that are far apart, public transportation doesn't make as much sense because the trains or buses would need to cover a lot more space and the, and, the, and the bus stops, the train stops, would not have enough density in one location. So you can see how a decision like a minimum lot size has, has, has a lot of other implications. It affects walkability, it affects cars, it affects the density, right? So each decision made had a lot of implications out, out where, okay? What about, uh, uh, Tyler, what's another way that this, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, did you already, um, uh, Morgan, what's another way that the city of Houston has gotten around not having a zoning code to change the way neighborhoods can look? Um, very good. So we've studied covenants in this class, right? And we did this entire discussion, remember, with privity. Oh, you probably blacked it out already, right? Horizontal privity and vertical privity, all the other garbage, right? You blacked it out. But in every case, we spoke of the covenantor and the covenantee, the person who gave the covenant versus the person who, who received the benefit of the covenant, right? In Houston, it's not so limited. Usually the only person who can enforce a covenant is a person who actually has the benefit of the burden from it. The city attorney under Houston law can actually enforce private covenants, which is a really interesting idea. Because effectively the city attorney can come in and say, hey, there's a covenant on this block saying that you can't have uh, you know, any kind of commercial businesses and you're opening a business, so I'm going to enforce it. What you'll notice is that a lot of neighborhoods in Texas, I'm sorry, Houston, have restrictive covenants. And you actually see these signs. It says like covenant controlled community. Have you seen these signs around? De yeah, they say deed, deed restricted community signs. They're all over the place. So in, in somewhat the same way as we did Shelley v. Kramer with the entire block agreeing to a racially restrictive covenant, this is not nearly, not, not, not terrible, but the same idea is if enough people on a block come together and agree to covenants, they can limit it, saying, okay, we'll only have one family homes on this block. We'll only have residential, we won't have any commercial. So covenants are a very powerful method in which the city of Houston can actually control land use. And once these covenants are signed, you know, they run with the land, they're good forever. So these become semi-permanent ways of controlling land use, right? Uh, Jane, what's another way that the city of Houston has been able to uh, control land use outside of zoning? Yeah. Going back to your idea of being kind of pedestrian, is that the city blocks for about 600 feet Good. while the EPA thinks that's a 300 feet block? Very good. So we have long blocks, okay? One of the consequences of having these minimum lot sizes is that everything's spread apart. And everything spread apart, you have longer streets, right? And so as Jane said, the streets here are usually about 600 feet apart from major thoroughfares. Uh, most places, usually about 300 feet. Uh, my parents learned this lesson very well when they came to visit me the first time. They were staying at the Sheridan by the Galleria, and they decided to walk to the mall. <laughs> Has anyone ever actually tried crossing Westheimer by 610? Has they ever tried? My parents were there for 20 minutes. They couldn't do it. Like, they, they were, uh, you, you can't do it. So, you've done it? Um, yeah, I have. My dad used to live in that area, so. Um, that's, that's, that's it. You have to be quick. Not not by 610, but I've tried crossing Westheimer in several of the more crowded spots, and it's very difficult. Yeah, and one of the reasons why this 600-foot street is difficult is because there are fewer points to cross, right? If you have these shorter streets, there are more points to cross. So these long blocks make it very anti-pedestrian. Although, in one respect, you need these long blocks because we have lots of cars and there needs to be eight lanes on Westheimer, you know, uh, 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 for people to be able to walk in. So related to the long blocks is also the wide blocks, right? Streets need to be at least 100 feet long for major thoroughfares, which is, again, if you think of Westheimer, that's what? It's basically a six-lane street going straight across uh, right by the Galleria, okay? 
What happens, uh, Avi, when you have very wide streets? What, what does that do? What, what's the implication of that? What's there less room for? Well, we know that residentials have big lots. So when you have wide streets and lot, wide lots, what gets cut away? Sidewalk. Sidewalk. Good. Very good. So I know this sounds stupid, but if you have long streets and very wide blocks and large property sizes, your sidewalk shrinks. Right? You say, oh, what's the big deal about a sidewalk? Well, many times the sidewalks are roughly four feet wide. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not two feet wide myself. So basically, you're, you're, you're like, you know, whatever. So, so, so basically, you take up one, you can't walk two people side to side on a sidewalk. It's too narrow. That's what I was trying to convey, but your know, minds are apparently in the, in the sidewalk or the gutter. So when you have these very narrow streets, it makes it difficult to have any pedestrian traffic. Also, you can't have, you know, businesses that have like, you know, sidewalk cafes because there are no sidewalks. So there are a lot of things that are lacking, right? Um, a related issue to that is parking. Uh, Brittany, what's the deal with parking in, 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 in Houston? Um, well, with, like, commercial business, it's still like the city that they have to have, like, I think it's 1.25 spaces, like, for an apartment. And, like, for, like, a shopping center, you have to have, it, like, one twenty. Um, so it has to be like almost two spaces one Good. Good. All right. So here, here's the deal. For any one bedroom apartment, there needs to be 1.33 spots for each one bedroom apartment. If there's a single family home, you need at least two parking spots. Any offices, for each thousand square feet, you can need about 2.27 spots. Bars, where people should be driving, of course. Uh, in bars, you need 10 parking spots for each 1,000 square feet, right? So think about this. I'm sure you've all realized this. you never actually thought about it. You have large lots, all this room for parking, these wide streets, right? There's really nothing left to walk around, right? Because in any given block, if you go down Shepherd by like Trader Joe's or whatever, there are all these huge parking lots in front of stores and, you know, team sidewalks, right? I've found in this city don't even have sidewalks. I like downtown so much. I know there are some places that I've had to walk where I'm literally walking on the curb and balancing on this six-inch curb because I don't want to go on the street. Yeah. So, so I mean, the city. Yeah. Is it really that bad though? I mean, half of the year it's unbearable. So you don't even want to be outside. Uh, oh, you're jumping out like five or ten minutes. <laughs> like, I'm like, so, but I'll about to say so what. That's my so what coming up soon. But I'm not. To, I'm not to my so what yet. So let's do the bad first. I'll do the so what part. Um, so effectively, it's, it's rendered this city unwalkable. We'll do this so what soon. Uh, there's really not much public transportation. There are not really places to ride a, forget about riding a bicycle. You have a helmet, you ride a bike here? That's risky. No, but I have, I have metal around me. I have a nice, I have a really big car. You have a little plastic helmet. I see a bunch of people out riding their bikes. It makes it really hard to drive around. Exactly. So. <laughs> So, one of the other implications, though, is because the city is so spread out, is we need lots of highways. And Houston has not one loop, not two loops, not three loops. We're about to get a fourth beltway. If you know, it's the Highway 99. Oh, no, was it? Uh, uh, Grand Parkway. That's it, yeah. Thank you. Grand Parkway, right? I've driven on parts of it. Yeah, it's not finished, but it goes maybe three quarters of the way around or whatever, half the way around. So, effectively, Houston's spreading out. And this sprawl that method has basically made it that the central downtown is only part of it. It's not like a middle around. You have these various patches. You have the Woodlands, or you have you know Kingsville, you know, or or whatever uh, 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 West University, whatever. You have all these different areas that kind of sprout up and have their own little locus of attention. And we know in Houston, and I, I asked this, but do people take the public transportation? Has anyone taken the, the, the train not going to the, the Texas Gamers or the, or, or, or the rodeo? Good. Good, yeah. And they're opening up another line. I know because there's always traffic on Rusk because uh, of that. But there's not meaningful public transportation. I mean, they have buses, uh, but there's not a subway system, and this light rail doesn't really go anywhere. Yeah, I, think it's a, I think it's not a – it's probably not going to be a, a very – very 
accurate representation to ask us how many of us have taken public transportation because we're going to school here downtown and what public transportation Houston does have, it all goes downtown. Right. Okay. So we have this sprawl. We have a very unwalkable city. We have, and I didn't even get into aesthetics, but people who care about these things tell me that city is fairly ugly. Does anyone want to? I don't care. I, this, I, no matter how many times I teach this, I can't get my hand around. I don't care what a city looks like. It doesn't matter to me. I, I couldn't care less. But apparently this makes a difference to some people. Concrete's fine with me. Uh, my office upstairs has no windows. I see darkness. So you know this, this is where I live. Uh, by the way, do you know why the school has so few windows? Has anyone ever told you? So the longtime dean of the school, Garland Walker, and this is part rumor, but probably part true. Apparently, had some sort of light phobia or light allergy, and he didn't like natural sunlight. That's why the dean suite is inside the building, and the dean's office has no windows. So as a result, he decided not to have a lot of windows. That's why these little slits in the side of the building were like you know, there's like six professors who get windows in their office, and they're like the cool ones. I'm at the you know, bottom of the pole, so I get I get darkness. Um, <laughs> it suits me well. So again, the city is not very aesthetically pleasing. Okay. So that's the downside. So now I get, and I actually have my notes next. Well, also the thing was air conditioning is expensive, and this is a lot cooler. Then very often you see these people build like these huge glass buildings, and they're so hot. So they built a federal courthouse in Phoenix. So it was a Sandra Day O'Connor courthouse, and the thing's a greenhouse. It's this huge glass box, and the summer it gets unbearably hot. And the winter becomes freezing. They didn't. They didn't think that through enough. So yeah. So now we get to the so what part of my life, right? right? And I come at this from a different perspective than a lot of you. Um, I grew up in New York City, which is probably the most dense city in the world, and has all the things that Houston's lacking: a very uh, a good public transportation system. It has all these zone districts where you can't build here, you can't build there. There's a very elaborate method of construction. You have to go through all these boards and approvals. Uh, there's all this low-income housing. They have a subway. Uh, the, the skyline is hopefully once again becoming beautiful. Um, so what? Does it make a difference about all of these things that make the city undesirable? And I think I probably get a diversity of opinions. So has anyone here actually lived in Houston and another large city like a New York or a San Francisco or a Boston or anything? No, I mean live. Like actually, where, where is it? Has anyone been an adult in a city other than Houston? Austin. Uh, Not Austin. Not <laughs> <laughs> I mean for live for a period of time. Uh, where? No, not Lubbock. What do you, what do you, Lubbock? No, no. I'm talking like where? Dallas. Oh my God, you're cute. No, not Marshall. Houston. Okay. Well, all right. So I'll. I will. All right, then I, I, will, I will serve as a surrogate, and I will act as your carpetbagger interloper who lived <laughs> till I was 18 in, uh, it's funny, when I was in law school, I went to law school in Virginia, and professor called me, he's like, you're from New York? You're an interloper. So I had to look that up, and then I knew what it meant. So someone from not around here, he, he was very right. So you have to look at this from a couple of different perspectives, right? Is sprawl actually harmless? Okay, and you can look at this two different ways. So on the one hand, right, as a result of sprawl, people tend to drive a lot more. They spend money on cars and gas and insurance. And these are people who would otherwise not drive to work. Um, I actually looked up some of these numbers. Uh, uh, Houstonians uh, tend to lose uh, 37 <laughs> hours more per year to traffic. So traffic here is fairly bad. Uh, but then again, I pose this again. If you live in New York City, the surrounding areas, you can't drive to work. Why? Because parking will bankrupt you. It's not possible. So this is not like 
if I lived in Brooklyn or Staten Island, I grew up in Staten Island, which was maybe about, without traffic, 25 minutes from Manhattan, with traffic, about two hours, okay? If I want to park my car in Manhattan, I'd probably spend $70 a day, okay? So it's often not the choice whether you want to drive or you want to park, you don't have the choice. So again, given the choice, would you rather sit in your car for 90 minutes or sit on a train for, for an hour? I, I'd rather drive. Uh, <laughs> Or I'd rather use a self-driving car, which hopefully we'll have in the next couple of years. Okay. So the mere fact that you can't take public transportation does harm a lot of people who don't have the choice. For example, people who can't afford a car, people can't afford car insurance. But for a lot of people who can afford a car but choose not to have one, it provides something of a false choice. Okay. One other aspect uh, that I that I, I would like for you to think about. Uh, is the cost of housing, okay? And this more than gas is, is hard to calculate, but it's very significant. It's almost impossible to measure how much cheaper it is to live in a city like Houston in large measure because of the zoning laws. Because when housing and land gets cheaper, everything else gets cheaper around. Okay, so I looked up these numbers. You can actually find it. it was an article in the Daily Beast, uh, which was it's kind of like Newsweek, but not anymore, comparing San Francisco and Palo Alto in the Bay Area. And the numbers are really interesting, right? So basically in San Francisco, only 14% of people can actually afford to buy a house. They have a very rigorous and effective zoning techniques where things basically can't get built anywhere. But as a result of that, you have a fairly small amount of space and you can't build up. No one can afford housing. And the housing is very expensive. And as a result of this, people are fleeing San Francisco. This is like Eric Cartman running as fast as he can. Um, the Bay Area has basically lost almost half a million people in large measure because it becomes unaffordable to live there. Um, in sharp contrast, places like Houston in the same period have grown by 30%. So when given a choice of having cheaper housing versus more aesthetically pleasing, and San Francisco is a beautiful city, I encourage you to visit, uh, the numbers seem to bear out that people would... So the actual cost of living adjusted is a lot more. So say if you're making roughly $50,000 in New York, that turns into about $75,000 in Houston because it's actually significantly cheaper not to live there, okay? Um, also, per square foot, everything gets a lot less expensive. Uh, now, to the argument about sprawl and spreading out, um, I think what we've seen in Houston, which has a unique advantage, is that there's a lot of room to move into. There are so many outerlying areas that you do not have a cap on the number of places to live. And that's one of the reasons why Texas has, has bloomed so much um, in recent years and has had so much of a explosion, okay? So we've talked about transportation. We've talked about actually cost of living. So there are a number of reasons why the policies here are actually um, more conducive to cheaper housing, okay? All right, any questions so far? Okay, these are not direct comparisons that people can choose, but to the extent that people are voting with their feet and choosing where to live, uh, they're choosing here versus other similarly growing areas. Okay? All right, so now I want to talk for a few minutes about one of the more interesting developments in Houston property law, and this is a story that's ongoing. Every time I teach it, I have to explain something different. This is a story of our good friends on uh, Ashby and Bissonette. Uh, if you don't know where this is, it's a couple blocks from Rice University. Uh, uh, near, uh, it's not in West University, but it's, it's right near that area. All right, so this story started in 2007. We are now in year seven of this saga, and it actually hasn't ended yet. Okay, so what happened? Um, Houston, in this area... It's a fairly affluent area. It's right near Rice University. The houses are usually very big with nice big lots. Um, a proposal was made 
to build a high rise that is not an accurate representation of the high rise. It doesn't actually have teeth or a uh, anti Semitic, horribly anti Semitic nose. I, I don't like that the depiction. I, I, yeah, it, 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 if you know the developers too, it gets, it gets worse. So they had a proposal to build condominiums. Now, we're not talking about building low income housing in Mount Laurel. This was going to be very nice housing stock with like a coffee shop and a market on the first floor. Okay? It's aesthetically pleasing. It was very nice. <laughs> if this was any other city other than Houston, this building would have been stopped dead in its tracks on a number of different levels. First, this area would have probably been zoned as one family only. No way you're building high dynamics. Second, even if the city was zoned as a mixed use place, right? All the zoning board of had said was, we think that this will decrease property values. We're going to deny you a permit, right? We don't want all these, you know, hipsters and yuppies living here, drinking their PBR. This is going to totally change the character of our neighborhood. We can't have this, right? So they could have denied it there. They could have said, you know what? It's too big. It's going to block all of our sunlight you know, for, for, for growing kale and whatever else people do in the neighborhood. Right? We do not want, I'm sorry, I'm being mean. I, I, this, we, I've, I've had a long history with, 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 with these neighbors, so I'm, I'm being a little bit too much. So I'll stop. So they could have stopped at a number of fronts. But Houston doesn't have these checkpoints. Houston doesn't have these gateways, right? It was allowed or supposed to be allowed to proceed, right? So what happened? Well, again, this is a very affluent neighborhood in uh, Houston. Uh, if you look up the housing prices, people there have mostly million-dollar houses plus. These are very expensive homes. So what do they do? They organized. Rather than using the channels of the city through the zoning board to stop the construction, they organized. They made a website. They printed out lawn signs. They organized all these rallies and protests in the area to try to stop the tower of traffic, stop the Ashby High Rise. Okay. At one point, they actually held a park-in. And you might remember this. Everyone knows basically uh, a, a shepherd runs through that area. It's basically a four-lane street. It's very congested. In the middle of rush hour, they all park their cars there in the middle of the street to simulate what the traffic would have been like. Right? They were trying to make the point, listen, if we have all these people from these condos, traffic's going to get so bad. So they basically just park their cars in the middle of the street. Parked in there. Yeah. By the way, uh, I don't know if you follow following the Uber uh, mess, but Uber is trying to operate in a lot of cities they are not supposed to operate. And as a form of protest, taxi drivers Drivers are parking traffic deliberately. Not, not the right idea. Not very productive. Not, 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 not the right idea. They, it's not a good idea. Anyway, so they hold these signs saying that this isn't New York City. What's ironic is they would want it to be New York City because in New York City you can't build anything without permission of the neighborhood. This is why they're so misguided, right? But well, I'll, 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 again, I don't think I have some problems with these people because they play shenanigans. So. They also held an organized rally at the mayor. They basically barged into City Hall and held this entire rally there trying to talk to the mayor. Okay? And they tried to make all these claims. They first said, oh, this thing will block sunlight, and it really wouldn't. And this thing would create noise, and it really wouldn't. And they said, this will like, make traffic really bad. And they did a traffic survey, and it wasn't that bad. So they tried all these obstacles of why they couldn't construct this apartment building. And at the very end, they basically lost all their challenge. I forgot the exact amount, but they spent uh, almost, um, almost a million dollars in fees just trying to litigate this. Okay. So as I was teaching this case last fall, I think fall 2013, so basically a year ago, um, they finally cleared all the legal challenges. They'd actually tore down what was there before. There actually were uh, apartments there before. And they were about to break ground in construction. And as I was teaching this, effectively one year ago today, students said, 
oh, didn't you see what happened last week? What happened last week? I'd actually gone there myself to check it. I took some pictures, and everything looked good to go. So the neighbors filed a lawsuit in court asserting that this building would be a nuisance. Okay. Now, you study nuisance in torts. I think you study in property as well. What's a nuisance? Well, it's generally some sort of land use that can harm someone else. So you think of air, water, light, pollution, noise, smell, common law nuisances, right? They tried to assert that this building was a nuisance. Why? Not because it was ugly, it's actually very nice, and, and, and not because it has any kind of pollution. It will be a nuisance because it's out of place. What renders it a nuisance is that it does not fit in with the surrounding area. And that's what the nuisance is. Okay? I have serious problems with this legal theory. And I've, you can, I've been quoting the Chronicle on this, so you can see that if you want later. Um, I think the problem with the legal theory is that it destroys what a nuisance is. Right? Nuisances are designed to things that might harm people. What they're effectively doing is what I call backdoor zoning. They're trying to cram into nuisance law zoning. Because what zoning's about is saying everything must look like. You can't have things that are out of place. So they're trying to accomplish through zoning, I'm sorry, they're trying to accomplish through nuisance law, which would really be accomplished through zoning law. Right? They're trying to use this process as a way to get around the fact that Houston has a zoning code, which raises a very interesting idea. In our legal system, if you recall, do you do the case called Boomer with the cement? At one point before zoning laws, state courts actually tried to police that kind of stuff through nuisances. And that faded because every place had a zoning code. You didn't really need this. So it's interesting to ask, in a city like Houston, where you do not have a zoning code, should you have nuisance as a way to control <clears throat> land use? So I think there are some serious problems with this approach, right? The most important one of which is it's impossible to know in advance where the nuisance is. You can't know in advance that something will be a nuisance. If I go to a zoning board and say, hey, I want to build this, they can at least say, no, 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 here's how you change your blueprint, do this or that. There is no nuisance board. Effectively what has to happen is someone has to break ground and start building something and a jury Years later, so that's, oh yeah, that's a nuisance, right? Also, this is a very expensive form of land use. It basically forces developers to go to court and fight for years before they can actually construct something. And since the Ashby high rise, there's actually been more of these. There's one in San Felipe and elsewhere in Houston, you have a Galleria, where people are trying to turn to nuisance law as a way to prevent this, okay? Also, if nothing else, this makes it impossible for poor people to oppose land use. If the only way that you're going to oppose construction by following a lawsuit, well, hell, most people can't do that. Okay. The counter-argument to that is, under the current regime in Houston, poor people are screwed. Right? Poor people can't print up lawn signs. They don't have the means to organize websites. They don't necessarily have the means to go to City Hall they can't take time off their jobs to park their cars in the middle of rush hour. Could you imagine explaining to a person living in low-income housing, yeah, take a day off from your work just to park your car in the middle of this. It's not even plausible. Okay? Only because the people in this neighborhood had enough money and resources could they pull it together and fight this opposition, those without these means can't. So nuisance law doesn't do good for anything, anyone but those who can follow these lawsuits. Um, Erroneously, in my opinion, a district court in Texas actually found that the Ashby high rise could be a nuisance, and I think that's probably getting reversed, although he did not grant an injunction, which was important. What the, what the neighbors in the community wants to do was grant an injunction saying, because this is a nuisance, you can't build it. So I think the judge did something that was somewhat sensible, but not entirely, We said, okay, you know what? Go ahead and build your building and pay one-time damages to the neighbors. In other words, the people who are right, right nearby and might have their property values diminished, one-time damages, and then build your building. 
So, I mean, the good side of that judgment is that the building goes up, it will be eventually constructed. Um, and the people who were nearby had some sort of compensation for any diminution in their property values. The bad side to this is to actually create a legal theory that's going to make development very hard. Because now anytime anyone wants to build something in a wealthy neighborhood, <laughs> they're going to go to court for two to three years. And they're going to have to pay money to the neighbors to actually do this. Right? And this is, this is going to be a pattern. If this is upheld, which I don't think it will be, it's on appeal at the moment, uh, uh, you're going to have a, a, a serious weird litigation focus of trying to stop construction in this area. And one, one thing that people don't necessarily think about is in, in downtown Houston, inside the loop, there isn't a lot of apartment housing, right? It's all, it, it, I'm sorry, there's not a lot of this type of uh, uh, housing in residential areas. And there's a lot of gaps where people, if they can't afford to live there, are kind of out of luck. Um, allowing more what's called infill, filling in a city with these types of apartment houses increases density, right? It brings people to the downtown area, which is the exact problem that we have with these large lot sizes. So I was actually somewhat surprised that the jury ruled in favor of the neighbors. I guess they were thinking more we want to preserve the status quo, having these you know one family homes, than rather than having all these uh, yuppies and hipsters move in with their uh, with their condominiums. Um, so this is a very difficult case. It's been going on for seven years. It's currently on appeal to the Court of Appeals. Uh, Texas courts move fairly slow, uh, but I think this actually might be argued at some point. Um, uh, it may be argued before Judge Busby, who you'll see in about two weeks. Uh, 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 you can ask him about this, but he probably won't be able to say anything about it. Maybe they're going to reverse it because they don't want to make Texas expand Texas nuisance law based on Houston's problem. I think this has to get reversed. Yeah. I mean, I've been, I mean, speaking my personal opinion now, but I don't think there's any way it gets upheld. I've been in the Chronicle about this. Uh, it basically redefines a nuisance in a way that I think is largely compatible. And it's very hard to limit this just to Harris County and Houston, right? You can't limit a Texas definition of nuisance in that way. So even if the Court of Appeals likes it, if this goes to the Texas. And also, didn't they rule that um, the building that the higher in the decrease um, property values? So, so yeah, so, so, so I, I think you make a fair point, right? We never know in advance what property values will do, right? You can't look at something in the abstract, which is why I think the entire property valuation is kind of silly. If you build this, what's your property value going to be in three years? We have no idea. What if more people want to live there because these are not housing near an apartment in university, right? A, a top, the top research university. You know, what happens if they build another one of these and a lot of people come there? You have a lot of people paying property taxes, right? These are condos. You own them. So we don't know what the property value is. Some, some places might have actually had an increased value. What I do know is that a jury awarded damages, I think it's somewhere in the neighborhood of a million dollars, which a bunch of the neighbors split up amongst themselves. So that's a one-time payment. Future people who want to live there now know that this they can take that consideration if they want to live there or not. Raise your hand. Oh. No, I just I just realized that I had never really known exactly where that was going to be. But <coughs> Ashby and this and that, I realized it was that big, empty, fenced-in yep. lot. And gosh, if you look at that with the surrounding area, that really would be hideous. Um. Okay. I can't imagine something like that right next to all of those old fancy houses. <laughs> well, in Houston, we don't have that test of whether something's hideous or not. That's not a consideration we have. I'm sure the people living there would like it as well. All right. So, other questions on Ashby? So, questions on Ashby? We may actually have to talk about this again if there's a decision in the next couple of weeks. I, I I was giving a talk on this last <laughs> spring, and the court decision was decided like the day of my talk. So, like, okay, I can talk about this instead. Okay. Um, one other area that I'll mention briefly, and we'll come back to, um, we discussed a little with Matt Laura, we'll come back to discuss Kilo, has to do with a relationship between um, race and zoning. And I alluded to this when I discussed the fact that in the last referendum on this in 1993 or whatever it was, uh, and the use in the African American community was very much vocally opposed to this zoning referendum. And I think one of the reasons why they were so vocally opposed is that, as we've seen, zoning is a very powerful tool of exclusion. 
And by limiting people to different uses, you can keep certain peoples out of neighborhoods. Um, similarly, if you want to make changes to the neighborhood, if people can't oppose it, they're out of luck. There are these two sides of the zoning code with respect to low-income communities. Um, on the one side, zoning can be used to keep them out. On the other side, the checkpoints in the zoning law can help people in a neighborhood stop a construction. If someone wants to build like the Ashby High Rise in a different part of town that wasn't so well funded, there's nothing that can be done to stop them. Right? This is often an issue with gentrification, right? Where people uh, come in, develop, and kind of make it too expensive for the people who are living there. Um, there's really no way of stopping the city of Houston because there's no way to preserve stuff. You can't. If if someone meets all the criteria for a building permit, they can go ahead with it. So there, there are definitely definitely pluses and minuses to this as well. All right. Uh, let's see. Mm, ah, this is fun. So I actually have these different numbers about uh, how far wages go. And um, the same wage in different cities takes you a lot further. So one thing which is nice about Houston, our graduates actually reap the benefits of this immensely, is that the same job that pays, say, $75,000 here would be like making $50,000 in New York. Um, because it's, it is living there is very expensive. Um, as well, um, you know, the tax is not so worried about now. Uh, the price to build, uh, this is what I want to show you, right? The, the price to build in city is almost $60 more per square foot than it is in Houston. In a large measure, it's so easy for developers to build here because they want to go jump all through these hoops. Uh, decisions like Ashby make that number go up and makes housing more expensive for all of us. Uh, oh, and this, this if, if you want to look at BuzzFeed, which I, I do occasionally read, um, they have a, a, I don't know why they picked this, but comparing, comparing someone living in, in New York City and Berkeley, I don't know how the hell they did this comparison, but a person living at $32,000 a year in Waco uh, on your left and living in Brooklyn on your right, uh, it was a little studio. Uh, you can see their kitchens and uh, other things. You can click on that at your own convenience. Okay. Any questions? Anything on your mind? Anything about Houston? How did the, like, I guess, we don't understand this, but how did uh, like Bel Air form its own city? Or how did they? I don't remember the history, but I think they were basically able to annex themselves out of it. I think they actually had some, like, I don't know if like it's a session mo movement. I'm not sure. I think they were able to separate somehow. There are a lot of these little villages in Houston. So if you ever like, if you're along I-10 near like uh, uh, near like where Voss is, and you see like Hed Hedwig Village, like other little village. These are effectively little enclaves. I guess they've seceded in one way or another. I don't exactly know how, and they're not <laughs> part of Houston. So if they were able to somehow make themselves a village. If they don't need a unanimous vote, including the Ashley owners. If you want to look into that, I'd be really curious. I don't know how, how you see it from the city of Houston. I'm not sure. But I guess you see some match to do it. And they're usually much more aesthetically pleasing, too, if you know where these people are. Yeah. Um, I don't think this, like, Delaware was around, Houston was around, but, like, Houston, the city limits didn't reach all the way out to Delaware. Mm -hmm. So you just, you just draw, and you take over the next I, yeah, I don't know. If you can look into the history, I'd be very interested, but I, I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, even if I understand correctly, along the I-10 corridor, like, there used to be nothing there, right? And then each year, it keeps getting pushed out, pushed out, pushed out. Um, but uh, I'm glad I wound up here. I like it. Anyway, anything else? Nope. Have a wonderful day. Have a good weekend. What? I'm glad you didn't end up in Waco. <laughs> hey, hey. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for watching.